Aziz Hashim. Hello there, our dear viewers in Nairobi and as well as around the world. Welcome to News Desk, the program that brings you in depth analyses into global issues affecting in the confines of politics, economics, arts and culture, and sports. But before we do start, let's have the highlights. Police have arrested a head teacher who allegedly showed up drunk to collect the Kenya Certificate of Primary Education Examination in Nyandara County. The teacher, Mr. Peter Kamaundegwa, who had private primary school, caused a stir when he staggered to the collection center at Nyandara County's commissioner's office, demanding to be served first. Elsewhere, Indonesian investigators searching for flight recorders of a crashed Lion Air Flight 610 have heard a transponder pings that could lead them to the devices and answer the question as to why the new Boeing 737 Max 8 went down, killing 189 people. And finally, President Uhuru Kenyatta defends Kenya's borrowing in an interview with the cable news network where the president remarked he is not worried. He further questioned why Kenya's debt crisis only focuses on loans owned to China. Our focus today is on the Kenya's debt, which stands recently at 5 trillion. And much of these debts come from China. China, according to the Business Daily, Beijing now controls 72% of the Kenyan economy. China now is the largest bilateral lender, leading with 534.1 billion, and the United States has only 3 billion, respectively, according to the Kenyan Treasury. This alarming figure raises questions on our government borrowing, and you can join our online conversation through my Twitter handle at AbdiazizHashim1, on Facebook at AbdiazizHashim, using the hashtag Newsdesk. Some of your comments are coming in and at Kevin Kimaili is saying that these numbers are staggering. We place them in those offices to bring change, not to drown us in debts. Traders or rather business operators have been complaining after the new tax laws and our reporter Faith Kaulu was on the ground to engage with some of them. This has been the situation for most business operators after the tax proposal of 2013 passed through the parliament when the president of Kenya made a few changes and in a controversial move, it was approved and assented into law. To add insult into injury, some products had to be taxed even higher, leaving the hard-working citizens out in the cold where goods are the only customers around. China's willingness to lend Kenya money for structural development and propel the economy has brought the country's economy to a halt instead. Fuel prices being one of the affected sectors, Frederick Kyoko highlights that it has been a struggle and the cost of transportation for goods has become a luxury. Uh, to Kenya, study to same transport, mm -hmm. they, they have hiked the prices. Mm -hmm. Like previously, we are paying like 200. Mm -hmm. Now we are paying like 350 to 400. China took interest in the continent because of the Belt and Road Initiative that will connect China to the rest of the world economically. This has raised eyebrows especially in the United States such that the country imposed tariffs on some Chinese products but this has not stopped the train of communism running through the African continent. The ramification of this debt has reverberated across the country leading to the rise of some products and making it hard for business women and men sentiments echoed by Mary Mukola. Kwa sababu ni kuwaeleza kwamba nilikuwa na wauzia nyanya tatu kumi na ni wanze kwa wauzia tatu twenty wadielewa kwa sababu gani. Uh, kwa sababu nikienda ile, ile transport inanibidi nyongeze. Kwa sababu pia nikienda kule kumunua na kuta nao wameongeza. Kwa hivyo kwa sababu ni nataka ni wauzie na wawo nataka kula tuka kubalia na pale ingawaji kulikuwa na wuhu. The influx of Chinese products in the market has also played a key factor in deteriorating the country's economy where the government is favoring big businesses in the country who are not faced with the new taxes, leaving the working community relying on the only figure closest to them. Faith Kaulu, reporting for the News Desk. Our reporter Faith Kaulu is joining us live from Nairobi. She has been covering this tumultuous issue at hand. So Faith, have there been any development and also did the government take this into account and to bring in substantive measures? 
Indeed, thank you so much, Abdi. Now, sad enough, the changes that are being noticed on the ground are not positive changes. Uh, like, for, take for example, as of yesterday, the price of unga had increased by 25 Kenya shillings, affecting the common mona inchi. One of the big four agendas of the government was food security. Now, the common mona inchi is wondering: is this the right direction towards accomplishing this promise? In most homes, where three meals was the cost of the day, you find that families have reduced this number to two in order to get extra money to cater for other needs and wants. The common mona inchi is complaining and feel like the government is favoring the bourgeoisies or if we may call this the high class because, you know, as it seems, they do not feel the pinch of the high taxes. But now the common mona inchi is complaining, but sadly enough, these complaints are falling on deaf ears. After airing that feature, I can see um, it has elicited some of reactions on Facebook. And at Edith Mbenesi, she's saying that we were promised good living standards. Instead, we are getting the opposite. Now let's get to the bottom of this matter. And here are some of my experts. Mr. Yusuf Dahir, a former senior manager at the First Community Bank and currently the business owner at Crescent Lubricant Limited. Thank you for joining us, sir. Dr. Samuel Morithi, also joining us live from Nairobi. He is the author of The Africa Crisis, Is There Hope? Thank you for joining us as well. And finally, joining us is Ms. Beatrice Onamu, an international relations lecturer at Daystay University. Welcome all to the program. Let me start with you, Mr. Yusuf, since you're a business owner. How do you think this debt affects the country's economy? Which means the, also the economy will shrink in the long run. And the impact is that uh, also the revenue collection will also reduce. So if you look at that, it means that uh, in the long run, rather than increasing the bracket of taxes, you'll have less tax collected and the government will have to borrow to fill up that gap. So we're looking at more borrowing in future again, but I think it's more on the conditionalities of international monetary fund, which has really advised the government to go on this uh, tax uh, process. Well, if you remember, the Jubilee government, or rather the current government, promised living, amicable living standards rather to the country. Where do you think the government is failing? And do you think we're going to go for recession like South Africa? I think, uh, I think the Jubilee government have been very bad to the poor people and uh, more friendly to the big business and big contractors. And that's why it has been mostly in, in investing in this big infrastructure so that they can able to get their kickbacks. But if you look at the local person and the local manager, they have been suffering because this increased food prices, increased inflation, uh, cost of health has been very expensive, the education, uh, life standard also has become very difficult. So I don't see is that uh, Jubilee has a solution. Because uh, the long run is that this is a government that has put its own agenda on in, uh, development uh, infrastructure, mm -hmm. spending spree. Mm -hmm. And we also see the same thing in this big four agenda which has been now put by President Uhuru Kenyatta. Mm -hmm. If you look at it in the long run, it's more like uh, an agenda for the business uh, which are owned by the states. Mm -hmm. And uh, some of these business are relationship uh, connection with the Jubilee government. It's nothing to do with the common one engine. So we don't see any solution coming from the Jubilee government unless probably there is kind of a paradigm shift in the leadership positions. I think this spree will continue for the next five years. And since the country is facing this tumultuous issue, do you think or what are certain recommendations that the government should be able to maximize some, some of this expenditure that they are borrowing from China and respectively other countries? I think the most important what the government needs to do is one, it has to reduce its expenditure and uh, work on an austerity plan. I think the biggest component in our budget is the recurrent, which is the salaries and uh, operations of the government. There are two levels of government working at the same time. So the government has at the end of the day to sit down and decide do they want to go ahead and having a provisional administration running parallel with the, with the devolution system. Or do they have one to have one system which is the central government? 
and that means they have to cut down its cost and reduce otherwise uh, this continuing borrowing will take the country into further debt and this will not be able to be paid in generation to come let me turn to dr samuel murithi in your book you have clearly talked more about debts do you think these debts are hampering the country's economy this has uh, to do with the history of this country yeah. uh, and it's not just kenya i think it's a, a dilemma that most of the african countries face that uh, for the last 50 years since they acquired their own independence many of these countries have tried as much as possible to acquire uh, to rely mostly on the on the western countries and uh, their reliance on the western country is meant uh, to bring development unfortunately that has not uh, come easy and nor have we achieved uh, realized any development and uh, since we to be able to cater for such development from by the the governments have been able to or been forced to borrow widely from the western countries and uh, in the borrowing uh, they have not been able to match the the payment and on that note also in your book you talk about corruption do you think it's a good idea keep borrowing so much money yet the corruption rates in this country are high this i can call it dragon of uh, corruption is going to consume more of us and we cannot even if we borrow we borrow we use it through corruption means we misuse funds really we are going nowhere so corruption will only mess up this country and that's the biggest problem yeah. by the way if we were to deal with corruption we don't need to borrow we don't need to borrow we have misusing a lot we are misusing a lot of funds mm -hmm. uh, and almost 90 percent of the money borrowed is wasted through corruption what advice can you give to the government to fully maximize the expenditure of which they are borrowing too much yet you have rightly put it no country can survive without borrowing uh the advice to the government is really to be cautious manage resources well and go for people who are corrupt uh, set uh, institutional structures that will ensure that no money is lost and uh, also deal with the carpet anybody who is caught stealing or because really corruption is is uh, public theft should be dealt with accordingly and uh, they should not be spared. In terms of uh, monetary policies, we should come up with the policies that are workable. Let's also bring Ms. Beatrice Onamu to shed light on the relations between Kenya and China. Welcome to the program. What are the Chinese offering that makes them so appealing than their arch rivals, the United States? Traders from China used to come to Africa and also traders from uh, Africa used to go to China. So the main reason why they are so much interested in China, of course, also is to fill the gap that was left by the West. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they felt that there's this gap that they need to really come and fill in terms of the economic uh, growth. At the same time, they are looking for market for their product. Because, you know, in China they have a lot of supplies and <clears throat> the market of China is already saturated. Yes. So they're also looking for uh, a place where they can come and introduce, uh, look for market for their for their products. And according to those relations, um, China has engulfed on the Kenyan economy. What what are the merits and demerits of such relationship? Okay, there's a lot of advantages and disadvantages uh, when you look at this relationship between China and Kenya. When you look at it in terms of infrastructure, yeah, of course they are coming to invest and are going to improve uh, the economy of, of Kenya. Just recently, uh, you can see the development of the SGR. Yeah, mm -hmm. so there's a lot of connectivity in terms of movements here and here, here and there, goods being transported in our roads. So it's an it's an advantage because it's going to boost the economy of Kenya. Yeah, mm -hmm. and of course also it provides that connectivity in terms of world trade, yeah, and also connectivities within the reg regional blocks in Africa yeah. or within the regional blocks in Kenya. China is mostly concerned with their Belt Road initiative. That's why they made Android into Africa. But do you think this is the only goal they have or do you think they want to make the Kenyan economy grow exponentially? Of course, they, uh, we call it the brick yeah? uh, road. Belt Initiative of China, it was an initiative that was uh, 
introduced by the Chinese government yeah, on investment and, uh, and trade in three countries, in three continents, Asia, Africa, and, and Europe. Uh, the relationship between China looking at the Belt Initiative, of course, it's both politically and economically instigated. Yeah? Politically, of course, they want to establish that global governance. Yeah, global, domi uh, global dominance yeah, in terms of the trade and the economy and of course also in increasing their influence globally. Yeah, so in a way, there's also political uh, uh, exploitation and also there's a mutual relationship because in a way we're also gaining. Look at our roads right now, look at the SGR. Not only in Kenya, they also had another product, a project in Guinea yeah, where they were able to build a dam to help them in their shortage uh, of electricity. Well, I'm afraid we have to stop it right there. Ladies and gents, thank you for coming to the program, Mr. Yusuf Dahir, Dr. Samuel Morithi, and lecturer Beatrice Onamu. Thank you for coming in. Let's take a look at some of your comments on Twitter and at Faith Kibor, she says, that was informative and an eye opener. Now welcome to my talk. This is what I think. The African continent is known as the golden continent for a reason. Yet we elect these leaders to solve some of the issues that are truly decapitating our countries. We elect them due to their promises. And if you saw the interview with CNN where the president said he is not interested in a third term. But shockingly enough, he said he's not worried about the Kenya's debt. Yet it stands at five trillion. And China is the biggest bilateral lender to the country, leading with 534.1 billion, which begs the question, who's going to pay that money? And if you're being real, who is going to lead a country that is plunged into the abyss of debt? Who's going to solve some of these issues? I'm afraid we have to leave it there. Do join me next week, same time, same place, for another scintillating segment. I've been your host, Abdiaziz Ashim. For now, goodbye.